So here we are in the third part of this series about the chemical context of light. And um, we're talking about water. Lots and lots of water, because water is essential to survival on Earth. Water is everywhere. Water is everything. 95% um, of plant mass by weight is water. What you're looking at when you look at a plant is basically a whole bunch of water and a little thin uh, layer surrounding it. 70% uh, of you is water. It's um, not an apt description to say that you are just a bag full of water. And the Earth itself is covered. 75% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. Water is everywhere. And that's a good thing because water is where most chemical reactions occur, especially chemical reactions involving macromolecules or very large molecules. If you think about it, chemical reactions aren't going to occur terribly often if you've got a pile of salt in one place and uh, I don't know, a pile of some metal in another. They're not going to be able to react very well. But if they're dissolved in water, oh, now those atoms get to interact with each other. Now things begin to happen. So let's talk about the constituents of, um, of, of what goes into water, what makes water so very important. And it comes down to different types of chemicals can get dissolved into water to create a solution. Now, a solution is simply a solute dissolved in a solvent. The solute is the substance that's dissolved. The solvent is the liquid that does the dissolving. So when you have a solute with a solvent, you get a solution. On the screen, you see, I don't know if that's sugar or salt. Uh, I'd be able to tell by the taste, but just by looking at it, I can't admit. I'm going to say that that's sugar. It looks pretty big and fat. So if you took sugar and put it into a glass of water, what happens? The water, the sugar dissolves. It's like it disappears, but it didn't go anywhere. It's still there. It's just the particles of it have spaced themselves apart evenly in the water. So the sugar in that case would be the solute. The water would be the solvent. Now, water doesn't always have to be the solvent. You can dissolve things in um, alcohol. You can dissolve them in oil. In fact, if you think about it, um, nail polish remover, isopropanol, will dissolve the nail polish off of people's nails. As it's dissolving, that nail polish goes into solution. So the nail polish remover, the isopropanol, turns whatever color you had, red or green, or I don't know what color nail polish you have. Um, so that would be a solution where the solute uh, would have been the nail polish itself and the solvent would have been isopropanol. Specific solutions that involve water, which are basically all the ones we're talking about today, are called aqueous solutions. So think aqua, right? Aqueous solutions are solutions using water as the solvent. So if we had sugar and water, um, sugar is the sol uh, uh, solute, water is the solvent. They come together to make sugar water solution. Salt and water or any solute and water come together to form an aqueous solution. Now sometimes those solutes will give you uh, additional properties. Uh, well, not you, will give water additional properties. Um, they might change uh, a, 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 a property of the solution based on the amount of solute present, not necessarily on the type of solute present. So whether you're using salt or you're using um, sugar or Kool-Aid, whatever, adding some solute to water will in fact start changing the molecular arrangement of the water. We talked about how water has these kind of weird um, hydrogen bonds. Um, it's, you know, the, the water molecules will be attracted to each other and push each other away. If you were to add salt, that changes the way the water is able to interact with itself. Sometimes um, in one circumstance, say at um, the freezing point, you know, really, really cold, the salt once it's dissolved, will interact with the uh, hydrogen bonds and actually make it so that the freezing point drops. So instead of freezing at uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, water instead freezes at 28 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's great because that also changes the melting point. This is why salt trucks will go out on the roads 
drop salt down because the salt will dissolve as the um into the into a solution as the snow falls and ice and water melts i'm sorry ice melts you form a nice uh, salt water solution we got that solution the uh, melting point is actually pretty low compared to the melting point of um of water without salt so it will in fact melt at 28 degrees we go in the other direction we look at boiling point and it's slightly different now instead of um lowering the boiling point what it does is it raises the boiling point uh, those salt molecules get in there and they might make it a little bit easier or harder for water molecules to fly apart uh, to break apart to uh, vaporize as using those terms of uh, that we learned a few lectures ago so it makes it easier to uh, I mean, it makes it a little bit harder to vaporize and when you make it harder to vaporize uh, it takes more heat more energy to boil uh, water when there's salt in it or when there's other solutes present which increases the boiling point and that means you end up cooking food at a much higher temperature than you'd cook it if you were boiling it without salt in there so when you see somebody add salt to um, add salt to a solution that they're about to boil that has the effect of increasing the boiling point um, making it cook hotter making it cook faster some people then turn around and say well I put salt in water to boil it in order to make it um, boil faster and that's a different process that's basically creating these little nuclei on the bottom of the pan that allow bubbles to form around it we're not talking about that we're just talking about the colligative property of increasing the boiling point when you add salt or uh, decreasing the melting point when you add salt to a solution or any solute not just salt but that's just the one you're most familiar with in nature we see colligative properties in action um, the rock cod, the parasitic wasp, and the springtail all use colligative properties to survive uh, conditions they otherwise wouldn't be able to without them. The rock cod is an Arctic fish that lives up near the ice of the um, of uh, the the frozen ice in the ocean. Now remember, if there's ice floating in the ocean, that means that that water is slightly below freezing because the ocean is salty. So these guys are living in below freezing conditions. That means that their cells have to be adapted in such a way to stay um, liquid in below freezing conditions. And they do that by basically pumping natural antifreeze, um, some solutes throughout their body. Uh, the springtail does the same thing. The springtail is an insect that lives in melt ice in Antarctica. Um, this melt ice is freezing cold but they're able to survive it because they keep uh solutes going through their system so their system does not entirely freeze over and the uh, parasitic wasp is probably the most insidious the parasitic wasp is parasitic because it relies on a, a caterpillar to uh, incubate its eggs um, so the wasp will sting a caterpillar and inject its eggs into the caterpillar but the caterpillar doesn't die in fact the parasitic wasp also injects some uh, solutes into the caterpillar's body so that even though it might be freezing temperatures outside, the caterpillar doesn't die. Instead, it's slowly eaten from the inside out by the larva of the wasp until they spring out of its sides um, as, uh, when they get big enough. So colligative properties are used in biology to prevent organisms from freezing to death in otherwise freezing conditions. All of this has to do with water having polar covalent bonds. In fact, most of the properties we talk about today are because water has polar covalent bonds. Oxygen has an extremely high electronegativity. That means it's pulling electrons to itself. Um, so one side of the oxygen molecule is going to be negative. That's the side where oxygen is, where the electrons are hanging out. The other side is going to be positive. Because of that, you have a negative and a positive, it can attract, it's, it's called polar, uh, because it has two poles, and it can attract other water molecules. 
Uh, not only will polar molecules attract, like polar covalent molecules attract other water molecules, they will interact with solutes in different ways. And there are three possible ways that water can interact with a solute. Um, that solute might be considered hydrophilic, hydrophobic, or amphipathic. Hydrophilic means that the molecule, um, it well, one, hydrophilic molecules very, very easily dissolve in water. Um, they tend to be polar. So they have a charge to them, and that allows the water molecules to orient themselves. It doesn't matter if they have a positive charge or a negative charge. Water molecules will orient themselves in such a way so they start to get uh, in between these polar molecules, dissolving them, breaking them apart, holding them in, uh, away from each other. So the water molecules cluster around it and break the, uh, um, break the structure, the crystals of these molecules, into their constituent parts. The flip side are hydrophobic molecules. Hydrophobic molecules, uh, they tend to be very nonpolar. They don't have a charge. Usually, they're made up of lots of carbon and hydrogen. The reason for that is carbon and hydrogen have almost the exact same electronegativity. There's no sharing. Uh, the, the electrons are shared very evenly. Because of that, there's no poles. So that tends to make it nonpolar molecules tend to be very, very um, hydrophobic. They fear water. And you can see in that example on the side, oil is an example of a hydrophobic molecule. It literally excludes water. It pushes water away. Hydrophobic molecules don't readily dissolve in water, but they could dissolve in other things. If you've ever had to get oil off, you might use like WD-40 or something. Um, you can remove oil. You can put oil into a uh, solution using other types of solvents. So hydrophilic molecules love water, hydrophobic molecules hate water. Hydrophilic molecules readily dissolve, hydrophobic molecules do not dissolve easily. And that leads us to our last category of amphipathic molecules. Amphi means both, so they both love and hate water at the exact same time. And here's an example of a um, phospholipid. Phospholipid heads orient themselves toward water. They're polar. The tails are made up of lots of carbon and hydrogen. They're nonpolar, and they face away from water. When mixed with water, they form some cool structures called um, micelles. They might even form bilayers, where you can imagine it, the, um, the heads all face outward, and the tails all face inward, almost like, I don't know, uh, this is a stupid thing, but it's the first thing that comes to mind is a herd of triceratops facing outward. Their heads face out toward the enemy. Their tails face inward toward their children. Um, or a, a, a group of wagons circling each other with one side of the wagons facing an enemy, the inside protecting the people. So those tails want to be protected from water. And on the inside, the heads want to face water. So you get a nice sphere called a micelle. So you got hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and amphipathic molecules will dissolve or not in water. Because of the chemical nature of water, because it's covalent and um, I'm sorry, it's a covalent polar bonding, we end up with a lot of super cool properties. Uh, they're listed here. Don't worry, I'm going to go through each one of them individually. Um, but these properties follow from its chemical properties. First off, water takes place in many chemical reactions. We mentioned that in the last lecture. We talked about it again. Two of the big reactions that deal with water are hydrolysis reactions and condensation slash dehydration reactions. Hydrolysis reactions are where you're going to break a molecule using water. So water is added to the system and the molecule splits in half. This is usually going to release some energy. It breaks bonds. The reverse of that are condensation reactions or dehydration reactions. For condensation reactions, you take two reactants and you put them together. And in the process, water is released. So these build molecules. They build bonds. Hydrolysis uses water to break bonds. Condensation builds bonds and releases water. Yeah, you're going to need to know those. They're going to come up again and again and again. Hydrolysis breaks, 
condensation builds. Hydrolysis uses water, condensation releases water. Water's incompressible. You cannot squeeze water tighter than it already is. You can't compress it down into a, a tank under pressure. Water does not compress like air does. So organisms can use water to support their structures. And this is exactly how plants grow tall and strong is they use water as a support. Water is used to eliminate waste. Um, you dissolve some dangerous chemicals in your body like uric acid in, um, in water in order to get it to excrete without damaging you. Water evaporates. Um, at room temperature, random motion can excite the surface of water molecules enough that it breaks their hydrogen bonds. That means that if you leave a, I don't know, a, a, a cup of water sitting on a dresser for long enough, those water molecules will break apart and float off. Um, they take with them some of the energy from the water. Over time, all of that water disappears. Why this is important to you is because of sweat. What, sweat is water with some salt in it, right? What's happening is as you sweat, that water will evaporate off your skin. The, uh, the heat from your skin will be transferred to the water, like that water will heat up, um, and random molecular motion will allow those individual molecules of water to um, sort of become vapor and get off of your skin. And as they're vaporized, as they're um, becoming a gas, they're going to take some of that energy from your skin with it. And you felt this as you get out of the shower. You have water all over your body, and you come out of the shower, and you feel cool. The reason for that is the random molecular motion of the water on your skin is um, causing the uh, hydrogen bonds to break, allowing some of those water molecules to leave and take heat energy with them. It keeps you cool. Other animals don't have this. And this is what makes humans so very unique and allowed us to become top of the food chain is our ability to sweat and regulate our own heat very, very efficiently. A dog can't do that. They need to pant. Most animals can't do this. Water has a high specific heat. So that means that it takes a lot of energy to heat up water and a lot of time for water to cool down. Um, that energy, uh, it, uh, that energy difference means that if you live around a body of water and the climate is moist, the climate will stay, the temperature will stay stable between night and day. It keeps a stable environment for plants and animals to grow in. Now, the flip side of this is the desert. If you look at the desert, there is um, not much water there. That means that there's nothing in the atmosphere to stabilize temperature. So during the day, it gets very, very, very hot. And at night, it gets very, very, very cold. But if you live by a lake or an oasis, the water surrounding it, uh, the water in that area, stabilizes the temperatures, keeping everything um, normalized so you can survive longer. Water molecules form drops that are cohesive and adhesive. So water sticks to itself using cohesion, and that's because of the hydrogen bonds between the water asserting themselves. Um, adhesion means the water molecules, uh, water droplets stick to nonpolar surfaces. They hold on to other molecules aside from water. This becomes important because you can use cohesion, uh, water molecules holding on to themselves, to literally pull water up from the soil of plants and up through their structures out to the leaves where water is released to the environment through transpiration. So if you can imagine uh, a chain of water molecules uh, all the way through the plant down into the roots. As one molecule is lost to um, trans, um, yeah, transpiration, as one molecule is lost as it uh, evaporates out of the plant, as it's leaving, it pulls the next molecule in line behind it up, which pulls the one behind it, which pulls the one behind it, all the way down to the roots where it pulls water from the um, roots uh, and from the, uh, the soil. You're constantly pulling water up the plant using the cohesive properties of water. Now, eventually, you run out of water in the soil, and the plant wilts and dies. 
But there we go. Water droplets form into that, that circle. Then you, you'll see this in your lab. They form into a circle uh, shape because the water molecules are all holding on to each other as tightly as they can. An example of cohesion that's usually found in, you know, intro biology labs is where you might place a drop of water on a slide, um, a glass slide. And by looking at that, you can see adhesion of the water to the glass as well as cohesion of the water molecules to each other. Um, if you were to place a drop of ethanol on a slide, you see something entirely different. The uh, water droplet is sort of this, this rounded, bulbous shape that is almost entirely round compared to the ethanol that looks just like a flat splat because ethanol doesn't have hydrogen bonds holding water molecules to each other, nor is it able to adhere to the glass. So looking at the difference between ethanol and water, as you can see on this slide, there's a big difference that cohesion and adhesion make to the shape of a droplet. Water also has what's known as a high surface tension. Um, water molecules are held together by lots and lots of hydrogen bonds holding onto each other. And at the very, very top of the water column, um, there's no water above the water molecules to grab onto. So instead of them, um, by grabbing onto, I mean the hydrogen and the oxygen bind. So instead of reaching up to bind, those molecules turn and reach back down. And that creates a very thin layer on top of water that's very elastic. It's harder than the rest of the water. Um, that, that elastic layer there is called surface tension. Uh, well, the layer is not called surface tension. Um, the result of that layer is called surface tension. So you got this really thin film. Um, and it's something that uh, objects can float on. If you've ever seen water bugs sliding across water, they are going to slide across the, um, the surface, uh, the, that, that thin elastic layer. They use the surface tension, the properties of surface tension, to keep themselves up. If you were, I don't know, some sadist or something, and decided to just push one leg of a water strider beneath the surface, that, that, that thin layer, they would sink straight to the bottom. Anytime you penetrate the surface, uh, that, that thin elastic layer, you just drop right down. You've experienced surface tension if you've ever belly flopped into a pool. Um, that smack, that initial smack that you feel, is you hitting the surface tension of the water. Um, you in interacting with it. You can break the surface tension by um, basically uh, putting in, I don't know, you're, you're going in feet first or going in with uh, your, your hands clasped over your head in a dive. That's used to break the surface tension, which means that you don't feel that, um, that tension interacting with the whole of your body. Um, so surface tension can be you can actually float a pin on on the surface tension of water um so basically you you stick some uh, i don't know paper towels or tissue paper on water and you could put a pin on top of that and you sink the tissue paper to the bottom the pin should remain floating on the surface even though it's very dense it's denser than water it's made of metal but it will still float because it's sitting on top of the surface tension once that surface tension is broken though the needle sinks. One way, uh, aside from physically breaking the surface tension, uh, breaking up surface tension, you could remove the surface tension of water by adding a substance known as a surfactant. These are soap. They're sort of amphipathic molecules that break apart the hydrogen bonds at the surface. If you were to put a droplet of soap onto, um, I don't know, you see a water bug skimming along the water, and you put a drop of soap next to it, it will sink to the bottom really fast. I'm not advocating you know, the wholesale destruction and death of these water bugs in the name of science. I'm just telling you what would happen so you don't have to go out and psychotically destroy them all. And then another major um, property of water is that water expands when it freezes. This is what causes ice to float to the top of a cup. Uh, if you've gone out to a restaurant, you've ordered a glass of water because, you know, you're like me and you can't afford anything else. Um, you'll notice that the ice is floating. 
if the ice ever ends up at the bottom of the cup and you have to do the whole like, oh, I'm trying to get the water out and then all the ice rushes at your face, you've experienced how oh, it feels like mostly my life. Um, but water, ice floats upward. It doesn't sink to the bottom and that has major repercussions for life. One, uh, as ice floats upward, it will create an insulating layer at the top of uh, water so that it slows down freezing for the rest of the body of water. This allows organisms like fish to live underwater all year long. If a lake froze from the bottom up, it means that eventually all of the organisms of that lake would be completely frozen and die. But it freezes from the top down. And then it takes a lot to get that bottom area completely frozen. Water has different densities at different temperatures. As you increase temperature, usually with most substances, as you increase temperature, the uh, molecules, so kinetic temperature is a measure of kinetic energy, the molecules move apart, which means that the um, density decreases. It becomes lighter. Same happens with water to an extent. Uh, if you're going from like 4 degrees Celsius up, water molecules move farther and farther apart, and they uh, the the, the substance rises up. As water cools, conversely, it gets denser and denser and denser, right until four degrees Celsius. So it's not a solid yet. Most, and this is critical, most substances will, uh, as they become a solid, get more dense. But water is as dense as it will ever get at four degrees Celsius as a liquid. That four degrees Celsius liquid sinks to the bottom. That's why all over the world, um, at the bottom of water, deep bodies of water, it's about four degrees Celsius, uh, give or take based on colligative properties locally. That four degrees Celsius water displaces the other water, which causes it to rise. Um, as it gets below four degrees, as things cool below four, water cools below four degrees, the bonds in the water molecules begin to crystallize it, and those water molecules are um, end up spacing themselves slightly farther apart than at four degrees, meaning they're less dense at, uh, as a solid than as a liquid, causing the solid water, ice, to float upwards. So you can have different layers of, of temperature throughout the water. That allows organisms that are aquatic to survive even in, when it's really, really cold at the top of the, um, you know, in the atmosphere. So water at four degrees Celsius sinks and above that will um, float upwards. Lots and lots of properties of water there. Water takes place in many chemical reactions, hydrolysis and condensation reactions. Water's incompressible. You cannot squeeze it into a smaller area. Water removes waste from organisms. It evaporates at room temperature, which um, allows you to sweat and remove heat from your body using sweat. It has a high specific heat so that in areas that have a lot of water, the temperatures remain very temperate. They stay this, uh, constant. Uh, it forms droplets that are cohesive and adhesive. They stick to each other and other surfaces. Water has a high surface tension that some organisms use to skate along it. And water expands when it freezes, leading to ice, the solid form of water floating on top of the liquid underneath. So we're at the end. Big takeaway is that there are many properties of water, and those properties are all caused by the polar covalent nature of water, whether it's how, uh, that water takes place in many chemical reactions like uh, hydrolysis or condensation reactions, or it's incompressible or it removes waste, it can evaporate at room temperature, has a high specific heat, forms droplets that are cohesive and adhesive, has a high surface tension, expands when it freezes. All of this is due to the co polar covalent nature of water and how it can interact with itself. Water forms solutions, a combination of a solute and a solvent. And they'll uh, in, in, in solution, water will act... Um, on different ways on different molecules. Some molecules that will interact with will be hydrophobic. That means they fear water. They're not going to dissolve easily. They, those tend to be very um, nonpolar. 
And you have polar molecules that are hydrophilic. They interact with and dissolve readily in water. And then finally, you have your amphipathic molecules, which are, they, they, they have hydrophilic regions and hydrophobic regions. So they, when placed in water, will automatically form structures like spheres, uh, micelles, with the tails facing inward toward each other and the heads facing toward the water. That was a lot. A um, lot going on with that one. So here's some content review questions to focus your studying. In the next, uh, in the next mini lecture, we're going to <laughs> you can love this. Talk more about chemistry. Uh, we're going to talk about moles and molarity and how to determine them for our purposes in this class, as well as acids, bases, and buffers.